Okay. And welcome once again to the third conference by Remembering the Accused Witches of Scotland. Um, this is our second virtual conference. And as normal with any virtual conference, we're having technical difficulties. So please bear with us. We have rehearsed. I know it might look like we're completely amateur, <laughs> but we have rehearsed an awful lot for this. Um, but of course, things don't happen on the day the way we want them to. So um, I do apologise now if you're having problems hearing us. I do hope that we'll be able to play all of the videos that we have. But please do uh, bear with us. And there will be a recording on YouTube at the end of the day. Um, probably be next week that it's actually available. But please bear with us. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce the committee. Uh, on screen, you have a few of the committee. Some are having technical difficulties getting in. So uh, again, apologies for that. So we're going to change the running order that we, we've agreed a bit. Um, so if there's a bit of jumping around, please bear with us. My name's Sarah Kelly. Um, I'm one of the founder members of Remembering the Accused Witches of Scotland. Uh, having set up a group called Fife Witches Remembered way back in 2019, along with some other members here. Um, and we don't have any of the other founder members on today, uh, as one of them is trying to get through. But uh, the first thing we did was to organise a conference in Dunfermline as Fife Witches Remembered. Um, this was such a success that the group kept meeting after the conference and it grew and grew and over lockdown we um, kept meeting on Zoom and so much has happened since then in two years. It's been a fantastic project. So uh, I am just going to talk about some of the people who aren't here today. Um, we have a member called Greg Stewart, who is one of our historians, and we'd love him to be here today, but he's had, had to do something else. And he is an author and collects all of the horrendous items that were used for uh, torturing witches and making them talk and confess. Um, he's got a wealth of knowledge about all of the places, um, in, certainly in Fife, uh, but we are really keen to expand past Fife and be remembering the accused witches of Scotland. And this is happening an awful lot. I'm going to pass you over now to my colleague, Juliana, who has also helped organise this conference. Um, and she's going to talk very briefly about what, why she's involved. Thank you. Good, mor good morning, everyone. Right, I've written a wee script because I do tend to walk on. So... <laughs> Uh, can everyone hear me? Mm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, do Right, so good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Juliana, and I'm a hairdresser from the west of Scotland. But in Rose, I do a few things within a group, and one of them is to help organise this very conference. Um, another is an admin on a Facebook page, so a lot of you might know me or um, recognise my name from there. Um, and I'm also going to be involved in a few other things that we've got coming up. I've been interested in the witchcraft trials um, and the subject itself for several years now. Um, and it really began when I lived up in Paisley. Um, and I heard about the Bargaran witches, or the Paisley witches, as they're also known. And I couldn't believe there were so many so-called witches in Paisley, never mind Scotland. I'd never heard of it before. Um, I got involved with Rose when I discovered that the only real official monument we have uh, for the accused is a plaque on Edinburgh Castle Esplanade, which is actually smaller than the size of an A4 size piece of paper, which when you consider that's supposed to represent over 4,000 people that were accused. I think we estimate between 2,000 and 2,500 that were actually killed um, in the name of witchcraft. Um, the monument itself on the Edinburgh Castle Esplanade is just up to your right as you come off the Royal Mile. And I actually had to use Google Maps to find it. It's, it was so small. I think I'm round about three or four times. Um, 
before I finally found it. So I made a few inquiries of my own um, with Historic Edinburgh Environmental Scotland um, to see if there was any more plans to have a fitting monument. Um, and everybody said no. So then I got in touch with Sheila uh, through five witches accused as it was at the time and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, I am very passionate about this campaign as it's very, very relevant to me as a 50-year-old woman who not only talks to her animals and they talk back, but it's been said on more than a few occasions that I fit all the criteria to have been an acute person at the time. But hey-ho, that's just me. <laughs> so anyway... I hope you enjoy the conference as much as we enjoyed it putting it get together. Never mind the technical mishaps <laughs> a couple this morning and everything else has gone fine uh, previously. Um, and uh, there'll be a QA at the end where you can ask questions in the chat and we can ask them for you. Um, but uh, let's see. So it's nice meeting everybody, finally seeing you. And I really hope you enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana. <laughs> We're going to move to Sheila, who's our chair. So pass you on to man. All right, I have to go now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, everybody. Yes, technical problems all over the place. Um, one thing I like about this conference that um, unlike last year's conference is I don't have to make a speech. So yay me. Um, so I just have to um, chat about myself for two minutes. So that's not going to be a problem. Um, I've been involved in this since 2019. Um, I went to the first conference and then I joined the meetings and the rest, as Juliana has already said, is history. Um, I um, have had to retire work through um, L Health, which has left me with a whole load of time um, to pursue my other interests. And one of the things I'm really interested in is social justice and um, the history of women and basically women's issues, feminism, the whole shebang. Um, so being interested in that and in Scottish history and finding out that really you only hear the voices of the regular folk in Scottish history because of the witch trials. And then you get this picture of um, subjugation and um, discrimination and the power list being taken advantage of by the people in power. Um, and that intrigues me, um, not only because the power imbalance um, that goes on when, in the witchcraft trials, you know, that the, the state and the crown and the church all worked together to um, vilify a section of society. And I find that whole dynamic fascinating. And also the fact that it's repeated throughout history. I mean, even if you've read the Sunday papers this morning, you can see it again. Um, power, people at the top can kind of do whatever they like. And it's the people lower down the social scale that suffer from it. So I find that all very fascinating. And then it's just the, the heartbreaking history of the stories of these people, mostly women, um, but not exclusively. Um, and like Juliana says, mostly older, older women, which we can relate to, unfortunately. Um, and how you know our place in society changes due to our age and uh, um, how much value is put on a female person about whether or not they're all, uh, whether or not they can procreate and um, you know and uh, you know what women's values are within a society is also very fascinating um, and like Juliana I can't believe that there are no um, memorials to these unfortunate souls that there is no there's no recognition of Scotland's history taught in Scottish schools and um, if you want to do Scottish history, you have to go to university. But if you should, we should be working towards getting people interested in history as soon as possible. And Scottish history is fascinating. I mean, everybody knows about the Tudors, but the Stuarts make them look like amateurs. I mean, it's, a, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but why are the Tudors um, so much in people's imagination and let the students aren't, which I don't really understand either, because like I said, they're fascinating. Um, there is just a lot of things about this which are perplexing and complicated. It's like, why does everybody know about the Salem witches? 
when there was only a couple of hundred of them. And yet in Scotland, we have thousands and nobody knows anything about them. Um, sorry, my cat. My, <laughs> my cat makes a, a, um, a show at every meeting. She's an honorary <laughs> chairperson. Aren't the you? cat's a great editor. She's making you stop there. Uh, so we're going to pass on. So we have this regular problem with, with Sheila. Oh, I can, yes, sorry, I've talked talk too much. Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm really thrilled to be part of this and hope everybody will want to um, help us and support us in the work that we're doing. Thanks, Sheila. That That's night. fantastic. I'm going to pass over to Mino now, who is our, uh, who is our treasurer. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I can't say that I have a, a lifelong uh, interest in this because that would patently be wrong. Um, I got into this, uh, I'm a councillor in, in West Fife, and uh, one of my fellow councillors, Kate Stewart, is uh, one of the founder members of this group. And um, I got dragged along to the open when we laid the, 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 the Fife Heritage Trust Trail uh, at Curis. Um, but before that, we did have a celebration of uh, Lilius Aedes, um birthday uh, in August of, when was that now? 2019, seems an age ago. Uh, and that got me you know, looking at things and, and Sheila stolen a little bit of my thunder uh, in that, you know, it, it came home to me that the Salem witch trials, which everybody knows about as a, as a social injustice on a grand scale, involved 19 witches. There were 15 women and four men. And it's known about all around the world. And what staggered me was that there are 4,000 prosecutions in Scotland alone. And Scotland was actually unique. I don't think there was anywhere else, anywhere in the world that actually um, conducted this, this hunt on such a, a grand scale of, of church and state together. And, and it's that injustice that really draw me, drew me into this. Because there's a lesson to be learned that, you know, this is what happens when any particular segment of society gets marginalised. This is the risk that you actually pay, uh, take on. Uh, and so that's really my main interest in being here and why I wholeheartedly support our ambition of a, a national memorial to actually recognise the, the great wrong that was done. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Mino. Uh, we're now going to go to Jane, who is one of the other founding members of, of Fife, which is remembered, um, the original group. So over to you, Jane. You have to unmute. Right, that's better. It's worked this time. Right, thank you, Sarah. Right, everyone, my name is Jane, and I live in one of the West Fife villages not far from Toryburn. Oh, I'm on the, the top road. Um, I'm one of the original members. I uh, was at the very first meeting in Dunfermline Library. I'd moved away from the village and came back about five years ago. And one of our other members got me involved in loads of, loads of different things. So I was kept on my toes, didn't, so I wasn't getting bored. Um, I'm always being fascinated by history. I love history. Um, but, you know, we never got Scottish history in schools, and it's, that's quite an injustice. Um, really quite, quite horrible, really. Got all, as Mino says, and I'm got, I don't want to repeat what Mino and Sheila have said, just all about the interest and things like that. Um, it's about all raising awareness about man's humanity to man and how easily people are swayed, their peer, peer pressure and you know, maybe jumping on someone because they've got something a bit different about them. Um, and I'm, I'm a member of the West Fife Heritage Network. And we, our first project was all about young people. And our second project was about Lilius Aide and raising the awareness and getting the witches trail, trial trail set up. Uh, Ros were fantastic support. They were there on the day. And um, um, I feel that we are working together with all the groups kind of merge and um, getting that done. It took two years. The first year we had a celebration about Lilia's 80s, what we thought would have been her death. 
And we had the Deputy Provost along with Lena Reith, who were on the shore at Toryburn, where Lilius has been not laid to rest. We don't know if she's resting, but where she has been buried. Um, and then the year later, the trial trail was launched. We've got the three bronze discs, one in Curis, one at the entrance to High Valley Field Woods, where Lilius was accused of dancing with the devil, and then one at the seawall in Tory Burn, where you can look out on and where Lilius has been placed. Um, this has just raised arms and legs. It's just rolling. It's got great momentum. We've got fantastic members. And I think um, lockdown came, but I think it done us good. We got more done in lockdown than we were getting at our monthly meetings. Just we had to hire a place for just an hour, but with lockdown meetings, we could have our, our Zoom conferences, our Zoom meetings, and I feel we got a lot done. And I hope you all enjoy your second online conference. And I think I've said enough, so I'll hand, hand you back to Sarah. Okay. Thanks very much, Jane. We're now going to go to Liz, who's our minute taker. As you can see, we're all different. We're all volunteers um, and we're recruiting today. What a surprise. So, Please, if you think that what we're doing is interesting, bear in mind that we're looking for volunteers to help join our steering committee and our various groups. But we'll talk more about that later. Over to you, Liz. Might go better if I unmute right, myself. Okay. Um, I was just actually putting something up on the chat for the running order. Um, someone can't get into our email, so I'll finish that off in a second. Um, so I'm Liz McMahon and as Sarah was saying, I'm the minute taker, membership secretary, record keeper, preparer of documents of all sorts, um, all your MailChimp things you've had sent out, um, they've all come, come via me. So anything to do with paper and pen is, you could say, my forte. Don't have anything to do with all your um, social media stuff. I'm way too old for that. I'll leave it to the, the younger ones in the group. And occasionally I'll get help from my nephews if I get stuck. So I came across the witches oh, ages ago when I was up in Tain on holiday um, with a friend. And we were in Dornach and we saw the, the commemorative stone for Janet Horn. I must confess my knowledge of the witches is growing it's still nowhere near what it should be but the more and more we get into learning about things doing research when i'm doing the minutes if somebody says something and i'm think i don't know about that i'll go away and find out pass it on to everybody to hopefully embellish our knowledge shall we say so i also went along to the first conference the physical conference in dunfermline hoping to learn all about the witches, um, about the individual characters, sorry, not the witches, the accused, uh, the individual characters, both ladies and gentlemen. However, it wasn't quite what I was expecting, but it was amazing. Totally, totally absorbing from start to finish. Totally enthralling. Everybody had so much knowledge, so much passion. Workshops were done on the day and Hopefully, maybe next year, fingers crossed, we'll be able to maybe do the same again and back into everybody meeting ourselves up. Now, there was going to be a meeting a couple of weeks later after the conference, so I went along armed with pen and notepad, as is my usual, and joined the group in Dunfermline Library. Now, Sarah, she was the chair on the night, um, asked if somebody could be a scribe for the meeting. Well, she noticed my pen and paper, didn't she? So I was duly nominated to be the scribe. And as both Sheila and Julianne have said, the rest is history. I'm still taking minutes for the main group uh, and the subgroups. I have got a bit more knowledge, possibly not as much as I would like. Um, but I'm in the fortunate position of being retired, so I can actually devote you know, a fair bit of time to Rose. Um, I've got one of my nephews who usually speaks to me on WhatsApp and he'll ping me a message first saying, are you with the witches tonight or can I speak to you? Is it a big meeting or a wee meeting? So um, so he'll actually come on to me. So, And one or two of the questions he's actually posed to me, I thought, well, it's rubbing off. 
Um, so hopefully long may it continue and I'll keep sending out bits and pieces to everybody and researching and just all doing the best. And one of these days we'll get our monument, we'll get it erected and you can all come and celebrate with us. So I think I've said most of mine today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks very much, Liz. We couldn't actually function without Liz taking a minute and, and keeping us all right and remembering what it was we promised to do at the previous meeting. Um, so thanks very much, Liz. It is appreciated all the stuff that you do. I'm now going to move on to, to uh, Margaret, who's going to tell us why she's involved. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Margaret Malloch, and I've been a member of the ROS steering group for the last year or so. I think when it went on to Zoom, it made it much easier for me to get along. And it's, it's great to be part of a group that's so passionate about remembering the women and men who were persecuted under the Historical Witchcraft Act. My day job is actually Professor of Criminology at the University of Stirling. And I'm particularly interested in the ways that the state and the criminal legal system apply gendered punishments and how people become criminalized, stigmatized and marginalized within and by communities. Um, I've been actively involved in various ways over the years in highlighting how women experience the law as both the accused and as victors, victims or survivors and the wider injustices that are experienced by many groups in their encounters with the law and the state, both past and present. And I suppose more positively, I'm also really interested in how local grassroots activism can help to reframe injustice and go some way towards building a fairer world, one that acknowledges that you know, our history is really essential in that process. In terms of the group, I'm the learning resources person for the group, although we work collectively around that. And we're in the process of building up a comprehensive resource list that we want to make available to people through our website. So we're currently working to develop resources for schools and colleges. And our plan is to work with local activists to help out with ongoing research into the witch hunts that took place in local areas so that we can help to build resources that can be used to share knowledge and information more widely. I know that many of you are working to uncover the histories of people who've been accused of witchcraft in your local areas and that's spreading all over the country. Um, so please get in touch with us if you can help us to share those histories. Um, and I really hope that everybody enjoys the rest of the day. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Margaret. I don't know if Laura's still around. She's our technical wizard and she was working away in the background, but she might not be here. So I'm going to pass on to, last but not least, because Laura's not around, I'm going to pass on to Donald, um, who is going to tell us all about his interest. He's our secretary. Martin Vahula Dunya is Misha Dolkaimo. I am Ursa Ross, I guess Hadrach Brunier Akam. Hanek no Hinsheren, I am Sengiltach, I guess Nahilenen. I guess Hami Erso na Hurehan Gurtoha, Biro of War Huch Yen Yen, Aho Hasich Buchach, Nanoch Lavasach Yale. I take it a lot of you won't understand the word of that. Now you know how they felt at the trials when they were Gaelic speakers. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I wouldn't think there'd be any translation services in the days of the witch trials. That was just to give a, a slight taste of what would probably be happening. The translation of it was, good morning everyone, I'm Donald Campbell, I'm a Royce trustee and hold the position of secretary. My ancestors came from the Highlands and Islands and I'm keen to highlight that most of those accused of witchcraft are probably Gaelic speakers. I'm not a Gaelic speaker. Uh, I'd just like to thank my father for the pronunciation of some of the words, one of which had 17 letters in it, but hey, well. Uh, I got involved with Ros through the West Fife Heritage Network, along with Jane and Kate Stewart. Uh, and basically, took from there, I attended the meetings, uh, I stuck my hand up to be secretary. And uh, the other thing I have been involved with is getting the charitable status through Oscar. So all, all things like that, uh, writing constitution, things like that. 
Uh, our secretary, I've uh, been writing letters to some of the, the high and mighty of our land uh, to try to get them involved. And, uh, well, that's basically it. Uh, I can see we're running out of time, so I'll let get everybody go on. Thank you. Thanks, Donald. That was great. Very impressive. Um, we are now going to switch ourselves off and welcome Julian, Professor Julian Goodair to give his talk. So if I could ask members of the committee to switch off their microphones and their screens, that would be fantastic. And we'll hand you over to Professor Julian. And he was the person who told me and the other founder members about monuments and monuments in Norway, etc. I'm not going to say any more. Um, he's an inspiration to us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, can everybody hear me? I hope uh, I hope my um, microphone is now working, but if somebody can confirm that I'm actually audible to the audience, then that will be helpful before I continue talking. Well, yeah. Loud and clear, sir. Loud and clear. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to this online conference. I've been very um, pleased that uh, the, the group has taken an interest in my work and the work of some of my colleagues. And um, I, I was asked to speak about remembering accused witches, but also about the survey of Scottish witchcraft. And um, many of you may well know the um, online survey of Scottish witchcraft. I think some people encounter it through the interactive map, which was added to it in 2019. Um, but um, I'm going to begin by uh, talking about how the survey began and what it was intended to do and some of the things that I think it does and doesn't do. Uh, and I'm then going to talk about the evidence for witchcraft and what we know about the accused witches of Scotland. And I'll try and place um, Scotland into some kind of context. And, uh, you know, the survey can tell us about numbers, but, you know, what those numbers mean. And I'll, I'll then talk about some of the numbers, you know, within Scotland and, um, you know, what it means if there were more witches in Fife or more witches in Lothian or fewer witches or more witches in the Highlands or whatever. Um, and um, finally, you know, some thoughts about remembering witches and what people do with witches today or what people tell me that they do with witches today. And, you know, there's a variety of uses that people have for witches and witchcraft today. And when we are trying to remember the historical executed witches, we have to put those into the context of how people use um, witches and witchcraft. Okay, so um, the uh, survey of Scottish witchcraft and uh, myself, uh, it was, the, it was my idea, though I couldn't have done it without three colleagues who I'll mention in a minute, um, but uh, how I got involved with um, studying the history of Scottish witchcraft is a curious thing because I began studying, began my career studying government and things like taxation, and I'm still interested in that, and, you know, political history of mainly Scotland. Um, but when I was still doing my PhD at the University of Edinburgh back in 1988, this woman came to the door, um, uh, Rosemary Gibson, and she was a filmmaker, and she simply wanted a transcript of a trial record that she had got from Register House so that she could make a drama documentary. And she was put on to me because, um, you know, I was the only person in the building that day who could read 17th century handwriting. And at that point, although I knew quite a lot about Scottish history, uh, I wasn't an expert on witches, and Rosie in some ways knew more, than, more about that than I did. Um, I had read Christina Lana's famous book, Enemies of God, The Witch Hunt in Scotland, published in 1981. Uh, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but anyway, um, Rosie employed me as a consultant for this film, and I then acquired quite quickly a good deal of knowledge about witchcraft. I'm sorry that the film was never made, but, um, you know, through that process, you know, I then, uh, you know, got 
the, this knowledge about witchcraft and then colleagues once I started my career would say oh Julian you know about witchcraft could you give a lecture about this or you know could you give a series of seminars about this and um, at, at the time I thought well you know I can teach this to others but there's no more to find out because Christina Lana has already done it and Lana had written uh, this book Enemies of God published in 1981 so that's 40 years ago now still quite a good book still a very good book in fact very just in the last couple of days you've used like a huge amount of data sorry um if um if people uh, need, need to interrupt me then um <laughs> then uh you know uh please make it clear that i i, I need to pause in my talk um yeah so um lana uh and um Lana, Lana's book is still very good, though uh, various things have been published since, which you know maybe modify some of her conclusions or extend some of her conclusions. And um, but I um, I thought back then that there wasn't any more to find out because Lana had already found it all out. Um, Lana had also directed a project that was a bit like the witchcraft survey that had tried to identify all the accused witches, and this was in the 1970s, and she had produced with a couple of colleagues a book called The Source Book of Scottish Witchcraft, which was a great resource. But um, uh, my friend and fellow witchcraft historian Louise Yeoman in the um, late 90s, I think it was in 1998, were having coffee and talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the witchcraft survey and thinking about you know, the, uh, the emissions that we knew that it had and the fact that it, you know, it had been done with very basic um, data uh, and that with more modern computers, we could gather a lot more data. And so I said, well, you know, we could actually replace the witchcraft, the source book of Scottish witchcraft and do a new, uh, in, you know, a new survey. Um, and I initially thought that, um, you know, this is in the 90s, uh, the uh, World Wide Web was at an early stage. I initially thought we could do this on a CD-ROM. We could sort of publish a CD-ROM and people could use this database on their computers. But, you know, in the course of the discussions in the late 90s, I realized that uh, it was possible to put a database on a website. And so it became uh, a project on a website, which was all very new and innovative back then. But we managed to get funding from the Economic and Social Research Council. And Louise and I um, uh, employed uh, two um, scholars, Lauren Martin and Joyce Miller, uh, who also brought uh, their own witchcraft expertise uh, um, to, to the team. And so there was a team of four of us that produced the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft that went online in 2003. 2003 is, is now, again, rather a long time ago. And, uh, and the Witchcraft Survey itself is showing its age. It doesn't look like a modern website. I keep hoping that I'll be able to find the time to apply for funding to be able to update it. I've also got more information about errors and omissions in the witchcraft survey. I think the witchcraft survey still basically stands up. It still more or less works. Um, the mapping facility that we originally had broke so, um, some years ago, but I was delighted that um, uh, some uh, colleagues in the um, in information services produced a completely new map in 2019, which is uh, uh, sort of based on Wikidata and uh, has um, improved some of the original survey by identifying more accurately some of the places that these accused witches were, were located in. But the interactive map and the original witchcraft survey uh, sort of work together, but more of the data is on the survey. Um, what the witchcraft survey does and also what it doesn't do. So I want to talk a bit more about that. Now, when we were designing the project, I said, well, you know, you know, historians, you know, we know stuff because we read these primary documents. You know, I mentioned this 17th century handwriting that, uh, you know, we can read. Um, and what I wanted to do was to um, sort of photograph the uh, the pages of the manuscripts and sort of scan it and just put the scans on the website, which would enable um, people to uh, um, do further research more easily. Uh, and some of the 
uh, original trial records have been published in the 19th century or 20th century in various places. You know, there are various printed books that publish this or that trial record, which, you know, uh, um, a wider range of people may be able to read. And I said, you know, could we scan that and put it on the website? But the um, the computing advisory people said, no, no, there's, there's, there won't be space on the server for sort of scans of documents. So that's, that's not possible, which is one of the ways in which things have moved on. Because, so, of course, if we did it now, that's exactly what we would do. Uh, and, you know, maybe uh, it will be possible to get funding to do it. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to recognize that the Witchcraft Survey is a project of its time and um, it has references to the primary evidence. You know, you can see um, uh, where it, it mentions that uh, particular manuscripts have been used. Uh, one of the things that's happened just last year, or was it even earlier this year, is that the National Records of Scotland Register House that holds most of the manuscripts has actually put a number of the manuscripts online. And the, the church records, the, the Kirk Session and Presbytery records, which is one of the sources that the Witchcraft Survey uses, has now been digitized and put online via a witch website called Scotland's People. So scotlandspeople.com, um, which is a site partly intended for um, genealogists, for family history researchers, but um, academic historians also use it. Um, so um, uh, in fact, some of the manuscripts that we refer to, you can now um, uh, just access online, anything with a prefix CH2. Uh, however, there, that's not all the manuscripts because we use various others that are still just um, sitting uh, in paper form in Register House and it, uh, they're not easy to access even for me at the moment. Um, so we don't um, get everything. Um, but what the evidence actually is for Scottish witchcraft, in many ways, the evidence is quite good for Scottish witchcraft and it's better than it is for some countries. Uh, on the other hand, in some ways it's not good. And we have got a lot of names and uh, in Scotland, we've got, um, I think somebody mentioned, you know, about 4,000, I'm not sure we've got as many as 4,000 individual names. I think there's maybe about 3,200 names. Um, but, you know, what the various uh, figures that you can toss about uh, actually mean, uh, you, you know, you need to sort of unpack what these numbers mean. When we were designing the project, you know, I always said we need to be able to quote a figure. People will ask us, how many witches have you got? And, you know, so the headline figure, I think it's something like 3,837, don't quote me on that, um, that we said we had identified that many witches, but that is based on partly uh, about 3,200 and something individual names, plus a number of groups where we don't have individual names for those groups. All we know is that several witches or many witches were prosecuted. And we, we said with those, well, we'll call them all groups of three. We suspect some of them are larger than three, but uh, you, you know, we don't want to inflate the numbers unduly. So we will be sort of conservative about this. And so we added in a number of um, uh, groups of three unnamed people. And we eventually got to that figure of 3,837. Uh, 3, you know, almost certainly this is an underestimate because some records have been lost. And, you know, you, you, can, you, you can sometimes see, um, you know, there is sort of qualitative evidence, there is correspondence that says there's a number of witches, um, but the trial records are not there. Most of the trial records have in fact gone. Uh, most of the trials, though not all, most of the trials were held in the locality in a sort of ad hoc local court um, that was set up just to hold a one trial. And it wasn't part of a regular series of courts. It wasn't anybody's job to, um, to keep the records. The, the, there did have to be a clerk to write things down. But, you know, after the fires of the pyre had died down, there was no particular reason to keep the records. And most of the records have disappeared. Um, some of them survive. We've got enough to get an idea of what happened. Uh, what percentage survives offhand? I'm not sure I could tell you, 5%, 10% maybe, but um, you know, yeah, be under, it'll be under 10% that what survives. So what survives is, um, is illustrative really of what was there at one time. 
but we do have a lot of names because the thing that has survived best is a central record of an order for a trial to be held. And if you go into the witchcraft survey and you get a name, um, the single most common thing that that name will be based on is a commission of justiciary, which is an order to hold a trial. So in the locality, somebody in the locality has identified a witchcraft suspect. They've gathered some evidence that this person might be a witch or is probably a witch, or they say this person is a witch and they want this person tried. So um, uh, um, the, the, the Scotland's local courts don't have the authority to do this themselves. And so, um, uh, they have to go to the central authorities. It's usually the Privy Council, which is the daily coordinating body of uh, central government. Sometimes the Scottish Parliament, if it's in session, does it. But the, the central coordinating body um, issues a commission of justiciary saying, OK, we want a trial held and you can be the judges, you convene a, a jury, you, you appoint uh, the officers of the court, you hold the trial. And a record of that commission um, usually survives. Um, so we can do numbers and we can do distribution. What we are less certain about is executions, because, as I say, you know, all we've got is an order, order to hold a trial. We suspect that most of those trials were held and we suspect most of them led to executions. But we do know of some acquittals. And so we can't say for certain that a given person, just because they appear in the survey, that a given person uh, was actually executed. We can say they quite likely were in many cases. Sometimes we know they were acquitted. Sometimes we know there was some other fate. Um, you know, Lilia Sadie's already been mentioned this morning. She's a, a, um, a witch who was never brought to trial because she died, uh, you know, during the process of uh, um, investigation and interrogation. Um, um, so there's all sorts of complications if, if you drill down into, you know, what do, uh, does it mean to be a name in the survey of Scottish witchcraft? But the, um, the basic definition of why somebody is there is that they were mentioned in a formal context as a witch. And so it's not just people for whom we have commissions of justiciary. Sometimes we have, for example, the formal confession of an accused witch who mentions a number of other names. You know, when I met the devil, I also saw so-and-so, 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 and so and so and we put those names in as well, because we know that in many cases, those people were also arrested, interrogated, executed, and so on. And so even if we don't have a record of them doing so, um, then, you know, we suspect that those people may well have been uh, also arrested, interrogated, and so on. So they've been mentioned as witches in a formal um, official context. Uh, a couple of things we didn't include, sometimes in local records, you can find slander cases. People will go to the Kirk session and, and complain, so-and-so called me a witch, so-and-so insulted me by calling me a witch. Is that a, a witchcraft trial? No, it's not. And usually, in fact, the Kirk session will back up the accused person and say, no, they, you know, the person who insulted you shouldn't have done that. And they will punish the slanderer. You know, uh, you know, it's a bad thing to call someone a witch because that's an insulting thing to call you. You know, just occasionally, perhaps the, they think the person was a witch. But usually, um, you, you know, these people are being called witches wrongly as far as the Kirk session is concerned. I'd like to see more of a survey, a study of a slander um, accusations because they're interesting in their own right, but those people are not accused witches. You know, somebody insulted them by saying that they were a witch, but the authorities said, no, that person is innocent, that person is not a witch, and so they don't go into the survey. Another thing we don't put in is sort of polemical or um, accusations at a higher level. You know, John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, you know, his um, enemies accused him of being uh, a necromancer, you know, which is functionally the same thing as a witch. Um, you know, I don't take that all that seriously. Um, you know, he himself was a bit, a bit hacked off by it, but um, but he's not in the survey. Um, uh, so um, I'm hearing various pieces of background noise, but uh, um, I'm hoping I should continue. Um, 
so the executions are tricky because we don't have many trial records and what we have to do is to extrapolate. And the best study uh, that has been done by this has been done by my friend Leif Helen Willemsen, who's a Norwegian scholar who I think has spoken at one or two of these events before. Um, and um, she was an advisor to the memorial in the north of Norway at Stelnes uh, in Varda, uh, which is a very impressive memorial. I'm very privileged to have visited it. I would love to see something like that in Scotland. Uh, but she has also researched Scottish witchcraft, and she did a statistical study of the rates of execution in different courts and broke down the likely execution rate and she came up with a, a figure of about 2,500 executions. That's a rough figure, it's an estimate, we, I can't give you 2,500 names, um, but uh, that is the most likely figure that I have seen for executions in Scotland. So what does that actually mean? Now I've been quitted a number of times and I'm going to go on saying this, that per capita of population that is about five times the European average. Um, the witch hunt is a European phenomenon, it's not a Scottish phenomenon alone. Uh, and witches are executed in just about every country in Europe that you can mention. And the only countries that don't execute any witches are the ones in Southeastern Europe, in the Balkans, which are occupied by the Ottoman Empire, which is ruled by Muslims. And they don't believe in witchcraft because it's a Christian concept and they don't allow any executions. And in my book, The European Witch Hunt, the only blank piece on the map is the Balkans. Everywhere else. There are some executions, but the numbers vary widely. And um, Scotland in early modern times has a population of about a million. That's the figure in about 1600. We can take that as a baseline figure. Population changes over time, but you know, um, uh, I, I take 1600 as a, a sort of baseline figure. So if you want to compare um, Scotland's 2,500 executions and 1 million of population, it's easiest to do that with another country that has a population of about a million, because if you do that, you're comparing like with like. So um, my book, The European Witch Hunt, has got a, a table in the back. Uh, I'm just sort of um, turning to it just now. And some of the other countries that have populations of about a million, Ireland, quite near Scotland, 1.4 million, somewhat larger, executions per capita, it's actually hard to tell. Instead of 2,500 executions, Ireland has eight executions that we know about. There might be a few that we've missed, but you know, the number is microscopic compared to Scotland. Uh, Portugal, even smaller, four executions that we know about, but still a population of about a million. Sweden also has a population of about a million. They have about 400 executions. So that's more in the Scottish um, uh, um, line, though it's actually pretty much average in European terms. So Scotland is well above average. Then we go to Switzerland, also has a population of about a million. Its executions, as far as we know, about 3,500. So Switzerland, actually per capita of population is more intense than Scotland. Scotland is not at the top of the league table, even of countries um, comparable to itself. But it is very hard to compare Scotland with a much larger country like Germany, which is not a centralized state anyway. 16 million population in Germany. You know, the overall average in Germany per capita of population is slightly lower than Scotland, but there's huge variations within Germany. France, 19 million, that's the most populous state in early modern Europe. Uh, and the executions are much lower. What have I got for France? Um, only about a thousand, though the, the French records are even more fragmentary than the Scottish ones. But you know, the French witch hunting is much more mild than in, for the European average. Germany is the heartland. But Scotland is certainly one of the uh, um, you know, intense or even extreme places, but it's not the only one, folks. And it's not the most anything. You know, superlatives are always tricky. You know, the most something, you know, um, it's very hard. You can also look at much smaller areas. And, you know, Liefel N. Willemsen looks at Norway's northernmost county, uh, um, Finnmark, which has a population of only 30,000. Um, and Finnmark isn't five times the European average like Scotland. Finnmark is 60 times, hugely intense witch hunt. There's a, a, about 91 witches. 
um, from a population of 30,000. Uh, but, you know, as you narrow the lens on the microscope, you can easily find places that are more intense than Finnmark. Um, uh, uh, and um, yeah, there are some in Germany, I could spend longer about this, but maybe I'll leave it to see if there are, are, are questions. But it's, you can't build a league table because not all the teams have got the same number of members in the team. Does, does that make sense? You, you know, you, 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 when, when you compare states, you're not comparing like with like. Um, uh, and so, you know, comparisons are very tricky. We can say in general terms that, that there's more witches in Germany than in France. There's more witches in Scotland than in England per capita of population. You know, England has a population in early modern times of about 4.4 million. So it's hard to compare it with Scotland's 1 million. Um, England is, we can say, well below the European average. Um, uh, uh, I think there's about 500 executions in England, but the English records are fragmentary too. So we're not really sure how many executions there were in England. Um, um, but, you know, historians, we do the best we can. Uh, so, so, so Scotland is a significant place for witch hunting. And I want to turn to looking at numbers in a different way and to breaking down Scotland. You know, Scotland is a diverse place even today. Scotland was a diverse place in the early modern period. You've got highlands, you've got lowlands, um, you've got the west, you've got the east, you've got the north, you've got the south. And uh, the easiest way to break the Scotland down is excuse me, is by county. And, you know, there are something over 30 historic counties in, in Scotland, um, but they're not all the same size as each other. Um, and, you know, this group is based in Fife. So Fife is sort of interesting. Um, uh, the rate of accusation and remember that, you know, if you look at the witchcraft survey, the simplest thing is to look at the names in the survey. And those are accused witches who may or may not have been executed. You know, probably more than half of them were. You know, if you look at the ratio between the 3,800 that I mentioned and the 2,500 that I mentioned, probably most of them were. But again, we know that some of them weren't. And, you know, we have to bear in mind the relationship between accusations and executions. But I now want to talk um, about the statistics for accusations, because those are our best Scottish statistics. Now, my colleague in the Witchcraft Survey, Lauren Martin, ran some numbers, and she broke down uh, the, um, the accusations by region. And she did this by grouping counties. Uh, um, uh, I don't want to go through the entire process that she uh, did, but I'm just looking at her table. And she, um, she, she created, uh, I think, 10 um, uh, regions that were groups of counties that she more or less formed. And the, these are the Lothians, Fife, and Fife was actually grouped with Kinross. Um, so none of these are single counties, Eastern Borders, Far North, Strathclyde, which is sort of Western Central Scotland, possibly similar to the old Strathclyde region, Dumfries and Galloway, Central Highland region, um, which is six historic counties, but actually not Argyllshire. So it's not the, you know, the whole of um, the region uh, uh, to the northwest of the Highland line. Um, and then two regions that she called Grampian and Tayside. And I've read those out in the order that she put them in her league table of accusations per capita. Um, and, it, you know, the first four, no, the first three are above average for Scotland. So the Lothians are at the top of her table. Um, Fife, which includes Kinross, um, was second, and the Eastern Borders was third. And those are the only ones that come out ahead of the Scottish average. You know, the far north, Orkney, Shetland and Caithness um, more or less hits the average. So the numbers are quite small. It's a population is much smaller. Um, when, so Lauren wasn't entirely comparing like with like, you know, the Lothians had 11 percent of the population. Fife and Kinross had 7 percent of the population. So, you know, um, similar to each other, the eastern borders and the far north had six and five percent. 
So those are the significant ones where heavy witch hunting took place. Um, the largest one by percentage of population was Strathclyde, 20% um, of the population, um, but only 14% of the accused witches. So it's considerably below average. But yeah, Fife, remembering that that includes Kinross, is 1.7 times the Scottish average, but it still falls well behind the Lothians, which is three times um, uh, the, the Scottish average. But, you know, the Lothians is a composite as well. There's three historic counties there, um, Mid Lothian or Edinburghshire, Haddington or, West, or East Lothian, and Linlithgow uh, or West Lothian. And um, East Lothian, or the constabulary of Haddington, to give it its formal title in the early modern period, that is the one um, that comes out top by county, um, 543 suspects. I, actually, I don't have Lauren's population figures for every single county. Um, but, you know, you know, that is the most intense of the three Lothians. And, you know, probably the top county if you did a league table of counties. A league table of counties, Fife would come, I don't know, maybe fourth or fifth. But not all the counties are the same as same size as each other. Fife is much bigger than Kinross for, you know, just to look no further. And so again, you're not comparing like with like, you know, what does it mean? Um, Fife and the Lothians, the, the two at the top of Lauren's table, you know, they may be at the top, they're obviously near each other, opposite sides of the fourth, uh, through being near the core of the state with Edinburgh as the capital. They're, they can get easy access to Edinburgh to get commissions of justiciary, it's not far away. Maybe that's a factor. Maybe they are the most intensely reformed, maybe the reformed church, um, you know, governs them most intensely. Perhaps we're even looking at the same thing there. But, you know, what do those numbers mean? You know, it's a tricky question. Um, there may have been variations from time to time due to idiosyncratic individuals. You know, when you get down to very small numbers, then, you know, just one or two individuals can skew things up or down. And, you know, the patterns are not smooth. Uh, but uh, we need to remember, therefore, um, that, you know, all these people, whether it's 2,500, 3,837 or whatever it is, um, uh, these numbers are all individuals. Um, or I should mention as well, having mentioned, um, you, you know, uh, the, um, the Lo Lothians and Fife as being the places where witch hunting was most intense. Um, one place where it's fairly clear which hunting was least intense was, was beyond the Highland line. Uh, the, um, many of the Highland counties have got very few witches indeed, and the ones that we do have records of tend to be on the edges of, of the Highland region. They're in places like Butte, which has got some lowland institutions and some uh, Scots speakers as well as Gaelic speakers, a lot of bilingualism. Um, uh, um, but, uh, you know, in Skye, the uh, Western Isles, Loch Arbor, Morven, probably few or no witches in most of those areas. And so, you know, um, reasons for that are in, intriguing and, you know, historians debate this. If you want to ask me about it, we could, but that's, uh, um, you know, uh, when you have league tables, there's tops and bottoms of league tables, but the, I mainly want the difficulty of creating a league table to come across. And the, you know, the fact that we have to remember that these are individuals, you know, every single witch you know, is an individual and, you know, every single person strangled and burnt at the stake is someone uh, who is worth remembering. So finally, in my last five or ten minutes, uh, um, I'll try and make it five minutes, uh, um, some thoughts about remembering. Now, I'm a historian, in case you hadn't noticed, uh, but I think history is mainly or basically about today. That may seem odd, but, you know, people hundreds of years ago are never going to come back. It's never going to do them any good. I can't save any of those witches from being executed, you know, and, you know, if we remember them, uh, that will not help them, but it will help us and it will help other people today and in the future if we understand humanity better. And this is a case study of how humans have behaved to other humans and we can learn things about the present. And simple um, um, uh, um, uh, sort of statements, ah, oh, yes, it's just like this or just like that, it's the same, but it's also different. It always is. But, you know, if we 
understand the past and understand the differences and similarities between the past and the present that helps us to understand the present better and that's my ultimate aim is to understand people today and to understand how we can behave more humanely and treat each other more humanely, I hope. There are various academic questions that people ask about um, the historic witch hunt. Uh, you know, what was the role of the reputation of the witch if there was one? Um, was this about the authorities? Was this about the common folk? You know, is this pressure from below? Or is this a top-down thing, you know, power being exercised onto people? Personally, I tend to, to see it as something in the middle. It's, but it's, it is about power but it's about the local elites. They're the ones at the sharp end and they're the ones who are most concerned about which is more so than the central state usually is. But that's an ongoing debate. Um, but the, the lessons, if we learn them, are indirect ones. Um, you know, we, we may be interested in patriarchy today, you know, and in, you know, uh, women's oppression today. Or we may be interested in panics over high profile crimes and the fact that, you know, panics over high profile crimes tend to lead to miscarriages of justice. Um, you know, the way that your authorities divide people into us and them, the, you know, we are the good ones, they are the bad ones. You know, that doesn't happen with with witches today, but it does happen with some other things, and there are some thought-provoking parallels. So, you know, um, so thinking about witch hunting in the present-day context is various ways in which we do it. Um, various ways of things that people do with witches today, and these are things that people tell me about. There's the, the remembering the executions, thinking about injustice. That's what we're here to talk about today, and that's one of the things that people do. We look back on the barbarity of the past, and this can be a problem. People like looking back on the barbarity of the past. There are people who are interested in torture. They're interested in torture equipment. If you go to the Museum of Scotland, there's a lot of thumbscrews and not much use of thumbscrews on, his, on witches, as far as I can tell. They're mainly tortured through sleep deprivation. It's hard to put that in a glass case. The Edinburgh Dungeon, I'm told. I've never, I've never visited it, I'm afraid. Maybe one of these days I'll manage to uh, um, psych myself up to visit the Edinburgh Dungeon. But I'm told they have a witchcraft display. Uh, what do they do with um, uh, the history of witches? I'd be interested to know. Then witches today appear in fantasy fiction, magic, you know, Harry Potter, witches in, in fantasy fiction and in children's stories, they're often self-identified. You know, people call themselves witches. And that's one of the things where I find it's important to, uh, to, to begin with historical witches by realizing that 400 years ago, 300 years ago, you didn't call yourself a witch. There are no good witches. Um, you, you know, the, talking about a good witch uh, in 1600 would be like talking about a good paedophile today. Um, um, uh, but, um, you know, witches, a witch is what somebody else calls you. And who has power to make that label stick? That's the interesting historical question. But the fact that there are people in fantasy fiction who get identified as witches or themselves call themselves witches is of interest and it helps to, uh, you, know, you know, vary the picture, but also muddy the waters sometimes. You know, there are practicing pagans who have a pagan religion today. Wicca is a word that's sometimes used in this context. Some of these people call themselves witches and they sometimes have their own interest in the executed witches of the past, but it is important to remember that the executed witches of the past were executed in a Christian state and they themselves all thought that they were Christians. Witchcraft today sometimes is spooky fun for Halloween, you know, have you got your Halloween decorations up yet? And witches sort of merge into demons, ghosts, all sorts of uh, spooky fun, trick or treat, uh, pumpkins, what's this all about? Uh, um, and, um, you know, my, my phone rings and my email inbox fills up every Halloween with people wanting to know about historic witches. And, you know, that's fine. But burning witches at the stake is not fun, okay? I think we probably all realise that today, but in you know the um, the fun that people want to have at Halloween, which I don't have a problem with as such, uh, is something that you know poses sometimes barriers to understanding. So none of these uses of witches are wrong in themselves. Um, um, but, you know, the, um, the misunderstandings about witches. Oh, yes, one more thing about the barbarity of the past. The thing I'm always told is, oh, yes, they dropped them in the water, didn't they? Um, and if they sank, they drowned and they were innocent. And if they floated, they were guilty and, and they were burnt. And, you know, that just shows just how barbarous they were and how ignorant and, uh, 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 and bigoted they were. Actually, no, please. No, they didn't do that. Um, they were not stupid. 
as far as I can tell, they were as clever as us. And, you know, they were as good at thinking as we are today. And um, when they dropped people into the water, they tied a rope to them, please, and they pulled them out again, all right? Nobody drowned. So can we stop telling each other that witches were drowned? And one reason to stop telling ourselves this in Scotland is that as far as we can tell, the swimming test or water ordeal was hardly ever used at all. Some countries it was used a fair amount. They used it more in England, as far as we can tell. They used it in the north of Norway um, uh, and various other places. It's never sort of dominant or standard. People like to tell the story today for modern reasons. They like to feel that they know better than the past. But it's not true, OK? It's a modern myth. And it didn't happen in Scotland. So can we stop talking about the swimming test? Not in the North Loch in Edinburgh, not anywhere, as far as we can tell. If there are witches' lakes or witches' pools, they're modern myths, okay? Uh, um, so understanding the myths and recognizing that what we all get told sometimes isn't correct um, is part of what academics do. And it's, uh, you know, we, you know we, we take down um, um, legends. And sometimes the stories that are told are stories that serve the powerful. And so academics, by saying, excuse me, that's not true, can actually be um, making trouble for those in power, which may be a good idea. But, um, in, you know, uh, uh, by saying, excuse me, that's not true. You know, that's not the most important thing that we do, but it's one of the things that academics do, which is why I'm pleased to have um, uh, a part in this conversation um, because it enables you to have conversations with others because I'm sure, you know, you all will be told, um, you know, sooner or later, oh yes, they dropped witches in the water and if they floated, um, they were guilty and they were burnt. If they were innocent, they sank and they were drowned, you know. Uh, and you'll be better equipped to say, well, actually, no, this is a modern myth arose possibly in the 19th century. Okay, uh, I'll stop now, but um, it, um, if there are questions uh, from what I've said, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you once again for inviting me and uh, good luck in the campaign for a memorial, which I'm fully behind. Thank you very much, that was excellent. Um, I think we all needed the kind of overall picture of where the, the witches did case came and your your ideal uh, ideas on the, the history and that was wonderful and um, all of the questions that we have in the chat say that was wonderful thank you I could listen to you all day um, and uh, I could listen to Julian all day so I'll ask you the, the um, Professor Goodyear's comparison about past and present witches is spot on and do you have any further reading. But one of the, the, the questions um, that really I agreed with was, um, I wanted to know if he feels that all records have now been discovered, or if there's a chance that there is still some hidden away waiting to be discovered. Uh, right, okay. Further reading, I'll take that one first. I mentioned Christina Lana's book, Enemies of God, still a very good book, uh, a wee bit dated now. Um, uh, Another good book about the hunting of witches is, is Brian Levac's book, so L-E-V-A-C-K, um, uh, Witch Hunting in Scotland, Law, Politics and Religion. There's various books that I've edited. The most recent one is Scottish Witches and Witch Hunters. Uh, so that was published in 2013. And um, so, so those, those books um, update Lana. They're all academic books. I'm an academic if you ask me to recommend books, I'll recommend academic books. There are one or two popular books that I'm sorry to say I wouldn't recommend, and I, I'm reluctant to be <laughs> pushed to name names of books I wouldn't recommend, but, you know, ask me afterwards or, uh, um, uh, um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, it, it, is, it is important to uh, reach beyond academia and to um, publish books that engage with the more popular audience. So, you know, anyone who can do that uh, it would be welcome to do that. Um, uh, uh, so um, what's the question about? Are there more records that, that remain undiscovered? 
Probably not very many. I think the witchcraft survey got most of them. Uh, um, where there probably are a few more is we only sampled the Kirk Session records. Now, the Kirk Session records are surviving quite large quantities and we couldn't get everything. Um, we think if a, if a Kirk Session discovered a witch, it mostly passed it up to the higher authorities where mostly um, the um, things do survive. So we think we got most, but there are people still discovering the odd accused witch in a Kirk Session record. Um, and probably most of those were not executed because they tended to go up to higher levels if they did. But they, they are still ones that we want to know about. And new things are still being discovered. Um, I'm together with uh, Lee Villain Willemson, I'm currently um, editing a book that will publish a number of the original trial records of a number of these uh, witches. And once we've got that, you know, you'll be able to read in detail some of the some more of the primary sources. So there is a lot more to be done, certainly. That's good news. We can keep ourselves going for a long time searching out new records in the Kirk yeah. Session, which yeah. are on Scotland's people now, but they're yes. okay. hard to access. Yes, okay. Um, somebody's asked for, for book references in the chat. When I'm not uh, in, in the spotlight, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll type some things in and put some things in the chat myself. All right. Brilliant. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, there are other questions. The first one that we got was, um, any suggestions how I would access information about Argyleshire? Very few records apart from the Butte trials. I don't know if you can do specific. Um, That's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, uh, let me see. Um, there, there is um, one of the books I, I co-edited along with Lauren Martin and Joyce Miller um, is one called Witchcraft and Belief in Early Modern Scotland. And that has a chapter called, I'm trying to remember the exact title, it's something like Witch Hunting in the Gaeltacht by Lizanne Henderson. And uh, so, um, so, so, so that chapter um, um, is a sort of overview of uh, um, the Highland records. It's not Argyllshire specifically, but um, it, it would point you to a few more things. So that's where I would start. Lizanne's books are great for, for the various small areas of, of uh, information mm -hmm. that, yeah. Um, one of my questions is what kind of monument would you like to see? What kind of monument would I like to see? Well, I'm just a historian, so uh, um, it, it, it's it's really hard to say. Um, uh, the um, the one that impressed me most was the one in the north of Norway. I thought that was a a, a very um, effective combination of history, architecture, and art. And um, you know, I visited this. Okay, and as a, as an sort of academic historian you know I'd already read some of the records I, will, I, I wasn't as expert as Liv was on Norwegian witchcraft but I did know a good deal about it and um, so yeah I sort of felt you know intellectually I know about this but by the time you have gone through that that memorial you don't just know you experience you feel and you know it, you remember uh, and so it, it's, it's, it's not just about um, uh, intellectual understanding this. Uh, uh, and, you know, that memorial really makes you think, and it has been done very sensitively, and it has been done in a very historically well-informed way. And um, so, uh, so, so that is the one that, uh, that really works for me. It's on a scale much greater than um, the, the, the kind of plaques that are being put in, in, in various sort of co cobbled streets uh, um, or in various parks. Uh, um, but, um, uh, it, you know, uh, it, it does a lot. And I could, I could talk more about what it is and, and how it works, but um, uh, you, you can find it on the internet. Um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, that, that's the, you know, I, I haven't done a sort of survey of different monuments. I'm told there is a relatively recent one in, in Salem, which we've been um, talking about. I haven't visited that, so I can't really comment on that. But um, looking at what other uh, people have done and, you know, other monuments that, that, that exist on the kind of scale that, uh, uh, that whoever wants to do one, um, you know, I think we'll, um, uh, um, we'll, we'll produce good results because there's certainly a lot of prospect for that. 
That's great. Thank you very much. Um, there's one question. I don't know if we've got time for this today. What are the other significant myths that the professor would help us bust? Are the significant, are the myths. significant myths that I would? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I and mean, some people coming into this tend to assume that they're all women, mostly women, you know, 15% men, and the, the that that complicates the picture. So, so um, it's not a myth exactly, but it's something that sometimes needs to be um, reminded. Um, uh, it is not done particularly for money. People are not trying to make money out of this. Uh, you know, it's it's done because they want to make an ideological point, a religious point, or whatever. Uh, um, but it mostly costs money, quite a lot of money sometimes. Um, uh, uh, um, I did a recent piece, in, little piece in History Scotland magazine, which um, you know suggests that you'd have to, you know, an unskilled labourer would have to work for five or six months uh, um, to earn the money that it would cost to execute a rich. Um, so you know, the local authorities mainly uh, and local elites are investing time and money into this because they believe in it. That's why they do it. They're not cynical about this. They are sincere. You know, they're not thinking, aha, who can we uh, accuse, even though we privately know that they're innocent. They're sincere. They're terrifyingly sincere. They really believe in this. And, you know, I don't find the evidence convincing. Some people, even at the time, didn't find the evidence convincing. Most of them, unfortunately, do seem to have found it convincing. Um, uh, but the, um, you know, the accusers and, you know, the juries, the judges and so on, um, they mostly, you know, pretty much all, as far as we can tell, are sincere, they believe in this, and the reason they convicted these people is because they really thought that they were witches. So they're not getting up in the morning and thinking, aha, who can I falsely accuse today? So um, it's working out how does, you know, you know how does that mindset work? Um, and I'm aware that uh, many of you in your group, you want to, you're interested in the witches, you're interested in the accused witches, they are the ones you want to remember. But to some extent, the ones you want to understand, you know, why do people do that? You know, mm. it, they're the witch hunters. You know, um, you've know, already heard this morning, you know, I could have been a witch if I'd lived back then. You know, nobody has ever said to me, you know, I could have been a witch hunter if I'd lived back then. Nobody's yeah. ever said that to me. Yeah. And, but, you know, um, today, we do not execute witches, but we do do some other things that perhaps future historians will think are unjust. So what do we do today that is unjust? How can we learn about injustice? That's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a myth exactly, but it's it's a way in which I would want to um, uh, sort of reframe some of what's talked about witches. So is that helpful? That's very helpful. Thank you. I think we've covered all of the questions in the chat. I've got lots of questions written down, but we're running out of time. <laughs> So thank you once again, I'll Professor Julian Goodet. Mm. That was excellent. And um, you've got a great start to this conference. Um, and I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as, as I did and, and the people in the chat did. So that's really good. Thank you um, for inviting me. Thank you. And I hope you'll stay with us as long as you can during yeah. the day. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass over to Juliana now, who is going to um, get a video set up for us, which is from the next speaker.